Hey everybody, welcome to the Gospel-Centered Life. Uh, as you know, for maybe you don't know, my name's Louie. And I'm Amy. And we're here today to present the first lesson in our brand new uh, spiritual growth campaign called the Gospel-Centered Life. And we're pretty excited about this, so uh, let's just jump right in. And we're going to, um, some of the stuff I think we're going to cover in this series is going to be new or at least different for you. So uh, I hope you get a lot out of this. And just right at the top, let me tell you, we would love to have feedback so if you watch this, please let us know what you think. You know, if you got any things to say that about, you know, if she does something that you don't like, tell me. And if I do something you don't like, tell her. And then <laughs> it'll be easier for you that way. Okay, so here's the big idea of lesson one. Each lesson is going to have a big idea just to help you get started. The big idea is, starts with Colossians 1.6, which says, Which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it, and understood the grace of God in truth. The gospel is bearing fruit. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Paul says. And it's increasing. And if that's true, then that means that it should touch every area of our lives. Every single part of us. Not just our religious part, but how we, how we are at work, how we are at school, everywhere. And that's the big idea. We want to look at, start to look at at least, how the gospel impacts and penetrates every single part of of our lives and how we can help it to increase more and more within each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Let's open with prayer. God, I just uh, I thank you for this study. I thank you for the power that is the gospel message. And I pray, God, that if there's anybody watching these videos or taking part in, in the small groups or, or coming to the sermons to listen to this, the message, God, we, we ask that the gospel would take on new meaning for everyone um, who's a part of the spiritual growth campaign. We ask that you would deepen our understanding of what the gospel means. And Lord, we, we ask that it would transform us in ways that we have yet to experience. And uh, we just ask that it would penetrate every part of our lives and that we would leave this study uh, feeling closer to you, um, more dedicated to you, and more changed by your gospel message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. And um, by the way, if you're watching this online, if you happen to come across these videos online on YouTube or wherever, and you uh, don't have a copy of the lesson plans, those are all available for free at ChristChurchOnTheRiver.com. Go to our website, click Spiritual Growth Campaign link up on the top and go from there. Okay, first point of this lesson is, is that as Christians, we often use the word gospel without fully understanding it. Now, I have to say, I was guilty of that for years because for years growing up, to me, the gospel was synonymous with evangelism. Hmm. And so I thought when you said gospel, you were going to tell me, you were just going to evangelize me again. And I was like, well, I don't need to hear that because I'm already a Christian. Yeah. But the gospel means more than that. Yeah, I mean, I hear gospel and I always thought of a certain type of music oh, that you yeah. hear, you, you know, or sometimes the gospel you think of as it's the Bible. That's yeah, just okay. the word of God. It's the whole thing and that's right. it. And it's sort of, right. you know, I think you miss the simplicity that is the gospel message and, and how it really filters through in, in everything that we're supposed to be doing. But there is an outline. There is some simple points that should be included, I think, in every gospel message. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you might even think the gospel is like the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but it's, but it's more than that. It's a lot more than that. The gospel is really the foundation upon which everything grows in our spiritual life. So... On your outline, you'll notice we have two things, uh, a couple of things here, actually three things, because I can count, um, that we want you to know. And the first one is the gospel is the power of God. Mm -hmm. The power of God. In Romans 1.16, Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel. That was a convicting little paragraph phrase for me for in my early life as a Christian, by the way. <laughs> uh, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Mm -hmm. And I like that it's saying it's power of God for mm -hmm. salvation. Right. That it's powerful, but it's powerful especially for one thing. Right. And that is the salvation of everyone who believes. Right. And it's that word salvation, I think, that throws people because you think of salvation as being saved or as getting, we, as we use the phrase getting saved, we say that, which is true, but it goes beyond that because mm -hmm. salvation covers my whole life. Salvation's mm -hmm. about my becoming more like Christ and my growing and my serving God and all those things that are not included with just hearing the gospel, accepting Christ, and you know, being baptized or something. That, that's all great, but there's more to it than that. Yeah, it's the redemption of every part of our lives that doesn't right. look like 
Jesus, I agree. Yeah, so the word salvation means more than what we, today we use the term accepting Christ, and I, those, are, those terms are not synonymous. Salvation's bigger than accepting Christ is. Yeah, so it is the power of God. So it's a powerful force in our lives, or it should be. And then it says, uh, on your outline, it says, it is the grounds of our personal transformation. Like I said, it's the, it's the foundation, it's the basis upon which you build. Uh, Peter says, in 2 Peter 4, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And I think that's that's key when it says that if you have these qualities and they're in increasing yeah. measure, which, you know, I think the danger um, as someone who maybe grows up in the church is that you think that, you know, the gospel is a one-time event in your life right. and salvation is a one-time event and that's it. And and the gospel is meant to create an ever-increasing um, sanctification or the right. process of being made holy. And I, I think we run the risk of of being too complacent and not understanding that we have become sometimes ineffectual or unfruitful. And that's just as dangerous, you know, as never hearing the gospel to begin with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Peter puts it in the, um, in the context of it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing process in our lives. Salvation's a process. It doesn't just, it's not just, okay, I get saved and then I get stamped for heaven and then, you know, we're done here. No, no, that's just the start. We start with that, but the goal is to become as much like Christ in this life as we can. Uh, and then when we go on to the next life, I'm sure we'll continue to become like Christ there. But for this life, yeah, it, it's that process. And we have to understand that, that it all is based on and comes out of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. no, no death of Jesus on the cross. There's no sanctification. There's, there's no hope of change in our lives at all. So it all goes back to what Jesus did. And that's a critical concept to keep in your mind, I think, when you think about the gospel. It is the grounds of my personal transformation. If I'm stuck, I need to go back and look at what I'm thinking and how I'm feeling and what I believe about what happened to Jesus on the cross and how that relates to me. I agree. Yeah. So, third bullet point there. The gospel sets me free from sin's power and dominion. Yeah. There's a big word, dominion. <laughs> Uh, Romans 6, which is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Yeah, and this, to me, is so relevant to our culture right now because we live in a culture and where, you know, even growing up in the church or attending the church, you hear that we're all sinners. And so it's almost like we've come to embrace that idea of, well, we're all sinners, so, you know, it's okay that I'm living in sin. God knows that I'm not perfect. And we've come to accept, I think, um, other sin and our own sin, and we become very comfortable in sin. And we don't, I don't think we understand how damaging it is, how much power it holds over our lives, and that the gospel was always meant to, if we allow it, to set us free from that exact struggle, that exact imprisonment. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that uh, for a lot of us, we underestimate the power of sin in our lives. Or, or and we'll talk about this in a minute, but we're, we kind of think, well, you know, if I just try hard enough, I can do it. We, we don't realize that the only way to really be free from sin's dominion and power is to come to Christ. It's only through Jesus Christ that that can really happen in your life. It's a, it's not just a, a, um, a motivational thing or it's not just an attitudinal thing. There's also a spiritual part to this that mm -hmm. only Christ could do on the cross and that we can't really see or grasp, but the Bible teaches us about it. But like Paul says, we're, we, we are dead to sin. We shouldn't be living to it anymore. And yet, to one degree or another, all of us do. Right. You know, so we need to understand that it's the gospel that starts the process of me, of you and I becoming free from that power of sin in our lives. Absolutely. And if I'm a Christian and I'm still struggling with sin, it's still coming back to the gospel and to Christ and right. what he did for me that's going to set me free from an onsetting sin. Yeah. And point two on your outline, if you're following along, is that um, my understanding 
an experience of this takes a long time. <laughs> I wish it didn't. Wouldn't it be awesome if it didn't? But it does. This is not a, a one-time shot. I think we, we sometimes make it up to be that in our minds, but it takes a very long time. First Peter uh, 2, 2 says, like newborn infants, um, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Yeah. There's this idea that we're not supposed to stay fed off of the, the former things, that we're actually supposed to be growing, maturing. We shouldn't be satisfied with the same food that fed us spiritually when we first became believers, but we should be digging deeper. We should be getting to new depths of the gospel and what it means in my life. Yeah. Now, it says a long time. How long have you been a Christian? Well, I, I can't pinpoint. So I'm, 30, I'm 33, so I right. would... I would I, I can't tell you an exact time. When were you so. baptized? Do you remember? How old were you? Uh, teen, maybe middle school. Like 13, 13 14, 14 maybe yeah. in there. I was baptized when I was 13. And you're 33 and I'm so... <laughs> I'm, I will be when you see the 65. It's a long time and I'm still struggling with it. So yeah. when we say long time, we're talking a long time. <laughs> Not just like a few days or a month or even a couple of years. This is a lifelong process it's, that we're... That it's we're, the longest time you'll ever do. <laughs> right. And I think this, this um, chart here shows that pretty well. Absolutely, yeah. I, I like this because it's, it's a visual. I'm a visual person, so I like to be able to see things in front of me. But that over time, um, you, you have a point of conversion, but from that point of conversion, something is going to happen. Two things are going to happen. One is that you should be growing in your awareness of God's holiness. Right. You know, and the second thing is that you should be growing in your awareness of your sinfulness and your selfishness. Two things that, well, I think we're all in favor of growing in the awareness of God's holiness. Yeah. I don't think we really like the idea of, of growing in the awareness of our sinfulness. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> it's not a popular idea. I can't imagine why. Yeah. And when you see your sinfulness and God's goodness, you two things are going to become really clear. One is that you'll begin to see God as he really is. Not as you maybe want him to be, or, right. you know, it's not uh, the kind of God where you can, you know, like, visit a buffet and take and pick and choose. You begin to see God rightly as he actually is, and, and that will mark your life. Um, I love Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It says, uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God speaking. Neither are my ways, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, especially I think today in our culture where people, people, when people say to you, I believe in God, it, you almost have to say which one or what <laughs> kind is he because even Christians do this. They pick and choose what they like. So I like this, I like that, but I don't like that, I want that. And that's not really coming to know God who, as he really is. That's coming to me making God in my image instead mm -hmm. of realizing I'm made in his. And so... Yeah, this is a real challenge for spiritual growth, I think. I think so. And um, the second is, is similar in that I see myself as I really am. Yes. And this one's quite sobering because I think <laughs> that none of us sees ourselves very accurately. We all have an image that um, we, we project and we lie to ourselves all the time yeah. about how well we're doing, how spiritual we are, how close to God we are, you know. Um, and sometimes it's maybe even a more negative and shattered image than is reality, you know. But mm. well, the closer we get to God, the more we begin to understand His holiness, the more we realize, oh, I don't, I don't match that standard. There's a, right. there's a discord, there's right. a dissonance. You know, yeah. and you can see that with a lot of people in, in scriptures that when they were in God's presence, they were so overcome by their sin, you know, yeah. like uh, Peter, when Jesus right. took him out fishing in the boat. And I always thought it was such a strange reaction when he said, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. Right. When he saw him do these miraculous things. But yeah. when you're aware of the holiness of God, you're also aware, I don't measure up in any way. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I think that people, because we're fallen people, we either make ourselves worse than we are or better than we are. We don't get right where we are and it's it's one of the things the holy spirit does in our lives is help us to see ourselves as we really are because you can't really change unless you know where you're really at that's true then if you're if you're deluded though i'm better or i'm worse then you're still you're still deluded mm -hmm. so that's the thing that god has to do in our lives yeah and jeremiah 17 9 and 10 on your outline it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick who can understand it 
I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Like this is, I, this is a very powerful verse and some very powerful language. The, the human heart is, yeah. it will lie to you. It will tell you all kinds of things that it, you, know, you want to, to believe. Right. And you just can't trust yourself, which is why it's, you know, it's hard, but we need um, other people even in our lives that can tell us hard truth. Yeah. And we need the Holy Spirit especially, because even the people you care about most are still going to lie to you. Sure. <laughs> they're still going to tell you what you want to hear, and they're going to guard your feelings. And, Absolutely. and God, God cares more about our righteousness than our feelings. Yeah, and that's why we have the Bible, because the Bible mm-hmm. is the same. It's objective. It's there. It doesn't change. And that's really important because, number three on your outline, uh, I must avoid my natural tendency to shrink the cross. Mm-hmm. Now, you'll see you've got another little uh, graphic there which we'll probably put on the screen. And it's basically the same, but you notice the cross isn't touching both ends of the arrow. It's not, it's not reaching all the way to that V between God's holiness and my sinfulness. I've shrunk it down now. And we're going to talk more about this in future lessons because I, 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 I can't really face how great God is, like you said. And it's really hard in certain areas of my life to face how, how messed up I am. Mm. So I want to be in denial about both of them. It's kind of a strange thing. And so what happens is then that we tend to do one of two things. We either, or both, we minimize God's perfect holiness. I I hear this a lot with people. Well, you know, God understands because I'm only human and blah, blah, blah. Well, what if he doesn't? (laughs) Then where where do you go from there? (laughs) You know? So we we try to bring God down just a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. Or the other is like it. We right. we will elevate our own righteousness. Yes, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll you know think that we're maybe not as bad off. Either we lie right. to ourselves, or we really inflate a, our good qualities yeah. in our own eyes. Or yeah, yeah. I, I, you see this. I hear it myself. I hear it when I counsel people and talk to people. You hear it all the time with people. Well, that's why well, I'm not that bad of a guy. Yeah, you know, I I did A, B, and C, but but I'm really a good person. I have people say this to me all the time, and they'll they'll tell you terrible things that they've done. I mean, really. Some of them really bad if they were drug addicts and they were stealing from their family and they were doing this and that. They were selling their bodies for sex to get money for drugs. And then they'll say, but I'm really a good person. Mm-hmm. Well, how low do you have to go mm-hmm. to be a good person nowadays? I mean, <laughs> at some thing? point, you just why don't you just say, you know, I'm really not a good person. What's, but we don't want to say that. Mm-hmm. We fight that really hard. And that's, you know, in the, when we go to the jail, one of the questions that we always ask you know, is, you know, number one, do you know what would happen to you if you died today? Right. And the second thing is, you know, what do you need to do in order to inherit eternal life? And you would be amazed at the things people come up with of, well, I've got good intentions. God knows my heart. I have right. good intentions. I, you know, I'm not as bad as this person over here. Well, I've never killed anybody. You know, <laughs> you're like, well, it's just, right. the just tend to get lower and lower exactly. sometimes. But, you know, it's when, when faced with the gospel truth, that we realize that, oh no, we're, we're brokenness. We need a Savior. If we right. don't know our brokenness, we never know that we need a Savior. Right. And one of the signs we need a Savior is you wouldn't be making those kind of excuses if somewhere deep down inside you, you didn't know that you needed a Savior and that you were broken. So, exactly. there you go. So, final point here is growing in the gospel means resting in Jesus as our perfect Redeemer. That we, we, we quit striving, we mm-hmm. quit trying to make excuses, we quit doing all these things, and we just trust Christ. Look at this verse. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, righteousness, that means a right standing with God, and sanctification, that means becoming more like Christ, and redemption. Mm-hmm. Boom, he, he's everything. He's all. Jesus is all we need, really and truly. That's actually a... Something straight out of the Bible. That's true, and I think that it's a mark. Sometimes I like the word "resting" there because yeah. it it has this idea that there's that you're at peace. Right. That there's that there's you know a, a resting. You're not. It doesn't feel like a struggle. It doesn't feel frustrating. And right. I think when we're feeling all that kind of struggling, frustrating, it's probably evidence that we're not doing that well. That we might be mm-hmm. missing parts of the gospel or misapplying them. Yeah, I totally agree that, that that inner struggle is is a signal to you that you're not really trusting. You may be saved. I'm not saying, by the way, you're not saved. We're just saying that you're not enjoying the full benefits that you can have from your salvation because you're still trying to do stuff yourself that Jesus did on the cross. That's why he said it is finished. Yeah. It was finished. It's done. It's over. I just have to trust him for all that, rest in him for all that, and he is the one and only perfect redeemer that you can have. 
So that's a little bit of what we want to talk to you about today. Um, following this, you've got some application exercises and some things to do in your lesson. So we hope that you enjoy that. Like we said, we do want some feedback from you. So please let us know what's going on. And uh, join me, please. Uh, we'll just close in prayer. Father, I just pray you'll bless those that have watched this teaching tape. And uh, I just pray, God, that you will help the, the groups, whether they're small groups or individuals or larger groups that, that see this as they move on into the exercises that they'll work on applying this to their lives. God, it's hard for us to admit that we have this tendency to shrink the cross, yet it's critical that we see and understand it if we're going to stop it and just simply rest in Christ. So help us to do this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.